Hi everyone, welcome to the HCI and player experience track. If you are here for the other track, you're trapped. <laughs> All right, let's get started. We have four talks this morning. Um, the first one is nominated, is uh, awarded as an exceptional paper. The title is Narrative Substrates, Verifying and Managing Emergent Narratives in Persistent Game Worlds. I think the presenter is Victor, and you're ready to go. Yes. So, hello, everyone. And uh, can, you can see the slides okay, right? Yep. Yeah, great. So uh, thank you so much for attending this presentation. My name is Victor Gustafsson and I'm a PhD student at the uh, XC2 lab in, with uh, Paris Saclay. <clears throat> so my, I'm here to present the work that led up to this paper, Narrative Substrates, Refining and Managing Emerging Narratives in Persistent Game Worlds, uh, conducted by me, Benjamin Holme, and my supervisor, uh, Wendy McKay. So we are interested in the role of persistence in a massively multiplayer online role-playing games or MMO, MMORPGs for short. So in the real world, persistence is this implicit property of nature that let plants and basically anything grow, change and continue over time. However, in game worlds like those in MMORPGs, designers need to specifically design persistence for any object that users should be able to change and also carefully consider how this uh, will impact the, the game overall. So we're also interested in how stories emerge from what players do in these worlds. And uh, one way to think of MMORPGs is as story generation machines. They're filled with these hundreds or sometimes even thousands of players who embody different characters in a fantasy setting, and they spend a lot of time and energy searching for and accomplishing their own or shared objectives while playing. So the outcome of this play is that they in fact generate these unique and personal history, histories uh, situated in this shared world. But in the way that today's games are designed, the meaning and potential influence these histories can have in the world is limited. So players in modern MMORPGs progress through these ambitiously designed narratives that guide and reward progression, but players don't really have any influence on the game since it's only their character's data that, that persists and not the environment itself. Although earlier games supported player influence more by persisting changes in the world, they heavily re relied on players' capacity to realize their own stories and lack this guidance for character progression. So what if we could combine and make use of persistence and narrative emergence to design interactive and engaging player histories? We could have players that would become true legends based on what they've actually done in the game, remembered and influential based on the stories that they play out. <clears throat> Can we let environments evolve based on how players interact with them? And can player histories support or even replace the pre-written content that designers are currently struggling to provide with players at a sufficient rate today. <clears throat> so the specific research questions we had for this paper was how to increase players' influence through persistence, and how can we selectively choose and reuse the narratives that emerge from what they do in the game. We conducted four empirical studies in which we gathered 434 stories from uh, 380 players' gaming experiences, and we analyzed them with thematic analysis. We found two main themes in the data, and the first theme, unique and first-time experiences, indicated that this lack of world persistence lowers players' sense of uniqueness and that designers of modern MMORPGs give up persistence and uniqueness to gain control over players' expectation of the game. However, we also saw that this control leads to more repetitive content and that non-persistent worlds shrink as players never have any real reasons to return to locations where they already consumed all the written content. The second theme we called meta-persistence and refers to our finding that since players cannot persist their experiences in the game, 
they leverage the persistent capabilities of the web or the internet instead. Although the extent of their meta persistent activities actually disrupts in-game play too, as players have access to these sophisticated databases of information, sometimes even before the game is released. Players also share many of their stories in communities and forums, uh, which we learned that game masters can curate into new content for certain games. So based on these findings, we derived four implications for design that we turned into our narrative substrates concept. Narrative substrate is a theoretical framework for designing game architectures that represent, manage, and persist traces of player activity as unique interactive content. Here, designers define the persistent structure as story events. Uh, they're persistent snapshots of events that occur in play, and they carry information about actors, objects, location, time, and the type of the event. Actors or objects that are linked with story events are called story artifacts. So players' interaction grow this, this web of story events, where the designers then can detect and synthesize the relationships within. For example, a co-occurrence relationship could be a character who visits a location wearing a sword that had been found there earlier. Or we have deviation relationships like unusual events, if a player betrays their guild or something like that. Or similarity relationships as repetitive patterns that designers can then sign off as, as significant for the, for the general or overall narrative of the world. Once a narrative can be formed, designers equip rules to decide how to represent it in the world, or more specifically, how players should discover and interact with it. So to demonstrate and test narrative substrates as a concept, we designed We Ride, a medieval fantasy sandbox MMORPG that we built in Unreal Engine using blueprints. So to give, to give you a feeling of what the game is like, I have, I'm gonna try to show a few seconds of this video. Step At last, so the classic hardcore PvP experience is back from the dark ages of MMOs. Once again, you are allowed to kill. And you can also uh, place your own houses and, of course, interact with the narrative substrates concept. So we implemented narrative substrate as a technology probe and we conducted two separate deployments of this probe within one year's time. In the first deployment we focused on story artifacts or items that persist story events. These story artifacts evolve with their owners and they reveal the history of previous players. So in the screenshot here we can see a player equipped with a historical staff or a story artifact, which in the left corner displays the persisted history of previous events. You can also see how far it has evolved in terms of chapters, which is like the levels, how old it is, uh, where it originates from, and uh, a list of the story events in the chronological order. So we ran the game for 11 days with 114 players and it proved to be a successful and working implementation of the concept. And players provided encouraging feedback in a questionnaire that we distributed to the most active players. They also revealed important design challenges, such as how to identify and filter which events should remain relevant over long periods of time. So we addressed this feedback and ran a second deployment of the probe in which we had made a complete overhaul of the game environment. We have many new features to support more dynamic gameplay and emerging stories, as well as a dashboard uh, where game, game masters can directly synthesize story events inside of the game. So here is a, a screenshot of the dashboard or the story monitor that game masters can use for synthesizing relationships between the events that are generated from players. And we use this to search the history from deployment one, and we planned an in-game sort of like a LARP event based on 
the most relevant stories that we then played out in the game together with the players. This dashboard was also used to place honor banners that directly spawns and reifies a past player made event to acknowledge the player. This player can then interact with the banner to receive a temporary and small power up that they could use to overcome a difficult dungeon or something like that. And, or other players can also destroy it if they want, but that would make them lose karma, which can eventually make them criminals and they can't access towns, etc. As a quick reminder, you have two minutes. Yeah. The second deployment ran over 11 days with 63 players, and we found that the narrative substrates concept can help game masters directly reify stories and create events based on player histories. We also saw that we can maintain the relevance of stories over time as we turned old story artifacts from deployment one into heirlooms in deployment two. We also discovered new design ideas on how to reify players' meta persistent effort, such as bug reporting and wiki building. So in summary, we've gained a deeper understanding of the role of persistence in MMORPGs, and we developed the design concept narrative substrates to reify and manage emerging narratives. We demonstrated and evaluated the concept with our own game, We Ride, and found that we can successfully preserve and build new engaging content based on player generated stories. So finally, we we believe that this work moves us one step closer to our vision by supporting designers to reify the emerging narratives that can represent players as true legends. And that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Any questions? If there are no questions, I have one. So it's a, it's a really interesting idea. I really enjoyed the talk. Running a, a LARP in a MMORPG sounds like a really good idea, but also a ton of work. What is the, <laughs> what is the most surprising slash funny slash, uh, uh, I guess, like interesting um, things you encountered in that process, in that long process, I'm sure it's a ton of work. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. It's been a long process. Um, I would have to say that it's, uh, it's, it's tricky to actually get to this meaningful representation of the narratives that even though we have all these systems, we need to really emphasize them in order to make them visible inside of the games. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's most of it. And also that players are uh, very supportive in, uh, in the concept and, and generating critique and, uh, and helping us on, on the way, I would say. Thank you. So. All right, let's thank our speaker one more time. The next talk in this track, now let me make sure I'm in the right <laughs> in the right room. The next talk is a paper titled, We Don't Play As We Think, But We Think As We Play, Evidence for the Psychological Impact of In-Game Actions. Uh, no, we did that one already. What? Oh, okay, sorry. That was from the last session. Yeah, I was like, sorry, it's been a busy day. All right, so my apologies. The next talk is uh, jump hair, improving jumping performance in first person video games through visual assistant. Is this a video or is this? A... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a video. Do you hear okay. me? Yeah? Yes. Can, you can play, oh, perfect. Hello, and thank you for having me at the F2G conference uh, in 2020. My name is Sebastian Mischtal. I'm with the Interactive Reality Experiences Group at the University of Applied Sciences and Arts in Hanover, and I present you our paper, Jump Hair, Improving Jumping Performance in First-Person Video Games Through Visual Assistance. 
Our paper is motivated by the problem that distances in 3D virtual environments, from first-person perspective, are difficult to estimate. Distances in 3D virtual environments are generally underestimated, what others refer to as distance compression. Another reason is that the character's body parts and body posture, to compare with the virtual environment, are not visible. And proprioceptive abilities, in this case kinesthesia, which provides information of the body position and motion, are not addressed through virtual output devices such as displays, headphones or vibrating controllers, which are used in video games. This leads to the problem that jumping tasks in 3D video games from first-person perspective can be excessively challenging. To cope with this problem, we created a visual assistance tool for 3D jump and run games rendered on the interface layer to substitute unavailable natural distance perception and eventually to assist the player during the jumping process. During our research, we found out that some gamers reject automatic assistance systems, which are often perceived as too unchallenging. So we wanted to create an assistance tool which is passive, with no intervention in the jumping process and which leaves full control to the players. The design of our jumping assistance tool is motivated by the crosshair, which is often used in action games, and the dot, or the circle, which are often used in walking simulators. The name of our jumping assistance tool is Jump Hair, which is obviously related to the crosshair. The Jump Hair dynamically depicts the distance from the player character's feet to the forthcoming edge. The player character's feet are represented by two short horizontal lines, which are always rendered at the same position on the center of the visual field. Another short horizontal line represents the forthcoming edge. Depending on the distance of the player character's feet to the forthcoming edge, the distance between both parts of the jump hair increases or decreases. Here you can see the jump hair inside a video game we created to test our jump. Hair. So in the first picture you can see that the player character is far away from the next edge. So the distance between the two parts of the jump pair is large. When the player character is moving towards the edge, the distance between both parts of the jump pair decreases. Here you can see the jump pair in action. The player can monitor the distance between the static and the dynamic part of the jump pair to decide when to trigger the jump button. The purpose of the game is to escape from a house, therefore the player has to collect keys to open gates. The player must not fall onto the ground which consists of lava. If the player falls into the lava, this leads to a respawn of the player character at the platform from where the unsuccessful jump was triggered. This jump is very difficult. Nope. Very close. Yes. When creating the jump pair, our main goal was to enhance the game performance, which is the essential purpose of a jumping assistance. We also wanted to not distract the players because we know that too many visual interface elements can be disruptive. We also wanted to gain acceptance among the players, otherwise the players would reject the jump pair. We propose two hypotheses. The first one is, using the jump pair leads to a better game performance with no increased distraction compared to using no jumping assistance. The second is, Players rate the jump hair helpful and prefer to use it compared to using no jumping assistance. Here you can see what we measured during our experiment. We created three test categories for our hypotheses. Game performance, 
player distraction and player acceptance. Game performance consists of jumping success, edge distance and playtime. For jumping success, we measured whether the character reached the next platform or fell into lava against the number of total jumps. For edge distance, we measured the distance between the character's feet and the targeted edge at that moment when the jump was triggered. For playtime, we measured the time the player needed to finish the game. The test category player distraction consists of presence, usability and simulated sickness. For presence, we use the MEC Spatial Presence Questionnaire. For usability, we use the System Usability Scale and for Simulator Sickness, we use the Simulator Sickness Questionnaire. The test category Player Acceptance consists of the Visual Angle and the Jump Pair Acceptance. We measured the Visual Angle to investigate whether the players are looking straight ahead, resulting in a Visual Angle near to zero degrees, which would indicate that the player is looking at the jumper and probably using it. Or, if the players are looking down, to use hints from the environment, resulting in a visual angle near to 60 degrees. For jumper acceptance, we let participants respond to five additional questions to rate if the jumper is beneficial. In our user study, the participants had to play the game with mouse and keyboard on a 2D display. In within subject design, each participant had to play the game twice, with and without the jumping assistance. After an introduction and a questionnaire including demographics, the first game run started. First with a tutorial level to learn the game, then playing the game with or without the jumping assistance. After that, the participants had to fill out the MEC Spatial Presence Questionnaire and the System Usability Scale. Then the second game run started, again with a tutorial level, and then with the game with or without the jumping assistance, depending on the first game run. At the end, the participants had to fill out the MEC Spatial Presence Questionnaire, the System Usability Scale, the Jumper Acceptance and Qualitative Feedback. The participants were recruited via email at the computer science department at our university. All members of the university were invited, students, professors, employees in administration and so on. 30 people participated with an average age of 27.43 years. Here are the results. When using the jump pair compared to using no jumping assistance, Jumps were significantly more successful. The distance to the edge when jumping up was significantly shorter and the visual angle was significantly smaller, which means less looking down. We found no significant differences in playtime, presence and usability. After the study, we decided to repeat our experiment with the virtual reality head-mounted display. We know that tilting the head with a head-mounted display is part of a natural movement behavior and it's easy. We wanted to investigate whether the players excessively tilt the head to estimate the distance to the edge by using hints from the environment or if the players are looking straight ahead and rely on the jump pair. So we conducted a second user study at a different university with a comparable sample, again with 30 participants and we used an additional questionnaire, the Simulator Sickness Questionnaire. We also used the Vive Pro Head Mounted Display. Here are the results. When using the jump pair compared to using no jumping assistance, Simulator Sickness scores were slightly lower. We found no significant differences in jumping success, edge distance, playtime, presence and visual angle. The visual angle was near to zero degrees in both conditions, which means looking straight ahead and probably using the jump hair. We conclude that the jump hair can increase game performances with no additional distractions. We measured increased jumping success, less edge distance, which means higher precision, no differences in playtime, no decreased presence, no decreased usability, 
and low simulator sickness scores. The jump pair can also be considered an accepted game element. The jump pair was probably used and most of the time the players were looking straight ahead instead of tilting the view. The acceptance rate for the jump pair was relatively high and the qualitative feedback support these results. We also conclude that the jump pair can function as a visual substitution of a jumping and distance perception in a 3D jumping game. But the jump pair does not provide performance benefits when using a virtual reality head mounted display. In our future work for the virtual reality version of our jump pair, we want to create a more advanced jumping assistance visualization, which better blends into the virtual environment and which intensifies the depth information already available in the virtual environment. We also suggest to use eye tracking instead of the visual angle to better investigate whether participants are really looking at the jump hair or other hints from the environment. We also want to investigate a contextual crosshair altering its design with changing context. When we are aiming, we use a crosshair. When we are walking, we use a dot or a circle. And when we are jumping, we use the jump hair. These are the references we used for the slides. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian. And uh, congratulations for also getting this paper um, awarded the exceptional paper. Any questions from the audience? Okay, I think that's a sign. It's a very clear presentation. Thank you. All right, now let's go to the next paper. Let's see, we've already mixed uh, the tracks. I also mixed the time. Let me see what else <laughs> I can mess up this morning. I believe the next paper is the game as a classroom. Understanding players' goals and attributions from a learning perspective. I think that's a group from Georgia Tech. Yes. All right. I think I get it. I nailed it this time. All right. Hey, everyone. Can y'all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. And can y'all see my slides? Okay. Y'all able to see my slides? Okay. Thank you. So I will be presenting the game as a classroom, understanding players' goals and attributions from a learning perspective, a paper that I co-authored with Dr. Brian McGurko at Georgia Tech. So a couple of points. Um, learning environments are similar to game environments uh, for a variety of reasons, but specifically they both frequently include some central notion of achievement where the player or learner can succeed or fail. Uh, two, games are frequently applied to learning contexts in order to boost engagement, achievement, or a variety of other factors. See gamification, game-based learning, educational games, so on. And uh, three, there is a plethora of extant educational research. It's, education is not a new field. Um, it's, I wouldn't even call it a young field. And this research might be useful to game designers and theorists in a translational way. We kind of see a imbalance between uh, between the translational research with gamification, where a lot of um, a lot of game-based research is applied to educational contexts, but the reverse is less explored. So I'm going to introduce a couple of popular educational psychology theories. First, uh, we have achievement goals, which are the motivational reasons for why people participate in difficult activities, and we can look at people's achievement goals in a two by two classification schema. One where there's the mastery goals versus performance goals, where mastery goals are motivations that are rooted in feelings of mastery or competence. And two, performance goals uh, are based in social comparison. 
We can also view achievement goals in the approach avoidant classification scheme where approach goals are where students, learners, individuals are focused on achieving positive outcomes and avoidant go goals are focused on avoiding the negative outcomes. Another theory in educational psychology, we have causal attributions and causal attributions are ways that we can help define how people explain outcomes that happen to themselves. Causal attributions can be broken down into the following four categories. Uh, we have internality, whether it's uh, also known as locus of control, whether it's something that's internal or external to the person. Stability, whether it's likely to change or stay the same. Controllability, whether they feel they can exert some sort of power over the situation. And then the globality, whether it's something that's, okay, a very specific situation. It's only this math test or it's all test and assessment I ever take in my life, right? And so with these theories, translating it to, to games, I want to explore two things. How are achievement goals and causal, causal attributions broadly related to specific components of player experience? And then two, more specifically, are particular achievement goals and causal attributions predictors of flow? And why, why, do, we, why do we care about flow? What is flow? Well, um, very, um, very, uh, very popular in, in game studies and player experience is uh, Cheek Sentmihai's theory of flow, which is a state of optimal experience where one is completely absorbed in a task, intrinsically motivating. It's completed for its own sake rather than external forces. And there has been a lot of research in educational psychology about how flow is involved in the classroom. So let's see how some of that can translate. To explore these questions, an online survey was distributed to 165 undergraduates, with the first measure being on their achievement goals, uh, a, measure, uh, a measure developed by uh, Heater back in 2011, uh, uh, modified from learning context to gaming context. Following this was a gameplay session with Super Crate Box, a game originally uh, released in 2011, um, but recently ported over to Switch, so still a pretty actively played game. And it is a, a 2D single player shoot 'em up kind of game. There's endless enemies uh, always swarming the player. And this game was chosen because it's a really difficult game. Uh, players will fail a lot, regardless of their skill. And with failure, it presents a opportunity for achievement or lack thereof. And so they're asked to play this for 15 minutes before returning to the next part of the survey which was the game experience questionnaire, a popular measure of player experience. And this measures a, um, this measures a bunch of different uh, characteristics, including positive affect, negative affect, competence, their sensory and imaginative immersion, flow, tension, and challenge. So wide spectrum. Following this was a questionnaire on their causal attributions tailored to uh, game environments specifically and wrapping up the method with a uh, demographics and history with video game survey, um, where interestingly, 50% of the participants identified with the title gamer. Okay, so let's broadly explore some of uh, the GEQ components with their achievement goals. And so looking at each of our achievement goal types, we see that mastery approach goals were uh, significantly correlated to every GEQ component except for challenge. Our mastery avoiding goals, complete opposite, there was, it was not significantly correlated with anything. And then our performance approach and performance avoidant goals were only significantly correlated with, uh, with one component each. We can also look at our causal attribution correlations with the GEQ. And we see more mixed results with controllability being significantly correlated to six out of seven of the GEQ components, internality and globality only being related to four, and, uh, and stability is only related to one positive affect. You know, diving into flow a little deeper, we see that flow is only significantly correlated with controllability when we're examining our causal attributions. And I skipped over when we were looking at our achievement goals, we saw that flow was only significantly correlated with mastery approach goals. And so let's dive into and explore this relationship with flow a little deeper. 
So a hierarchical linear regression was conducted to explore the effects of causal uh, controllability and mastery approach achievement goals on flow over and above challenge and immersion. And the reason that challenge and immersion were included is that they are very typical considerations when designing for flow experiences in video games. Um, Malone proposed that games are intrinsically motivating due to three factors, curiosity, fantasy, and challenge. And so we wanted to include these in lower steps of our regression to, to see if causal controllability and mastery approach achievement goals were significant over and above them. And that is precisely what we saw. Uh, we saw that each additional step of the regression was significant over and above the previous step, and that each additional factor accounted for a significant increase in the reduction of variability of flow. So what does this all mean? Um, Based on these results, we suggest that game designers who wish to promote flow experiences not only design for challenge and immersion, but also design experiences that encourage players to form mastery approach achievement goals and feelings of causal controllability. Educators have made successful attempts at doing this in learning contexts, uh, forming such mindsets. But the translation to game environments needs further exploration. I think it's a really exciting uh, pursuit in the future. Thank you. Thank you, William. It's a very nice presentation. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Let's see, I might have some in chat. There is one question from Colin. Are there any existing games that offer a good model? Hmm. A good model on how to achieve this. Uh, in, in, my, in, in my literature review, I have not come over any that specifically uh, target these variables, but in the classroom, there is extant uh, research on this, such as um, transforming student mindsets through um, presenting material to them in, in very specific ways. And so that's future research I would love to uh, conduct. All right, if there are no further questions, let's thank our speakers and let's go move on to the final talk in this track. Krypton eyed playing with gaze without looking. And I believe this is another video presentation. All right. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining me today for this presentation. I'm Argenio Ramirez Gomez from Lancaster University in the UK, and I'm going to talk about Kryptonite, a game that proposes to play with gaze interaction without looking. In Kryptonite, players take control of Wonder Eye, a superhero with the power to teleport. Players need to close their eyes and roll them with the eyelids closed to trigger teleportation and guide our superhero through different challenges to defeat the crypto monsters. Kryptonite contributes a new style of gaze interaction in games by leveraging what we can do with the eyes closed. This is very much in contrast with state-of-the-art gaze-enabled games that have their focus on designing interactions that rely on looking at the screen and the game scene. They utilize the input from both eyes, so the exact point where the players look on the screen and the game scene, and transform it into actions in the game. For instance, players could aim their weapons by looking at the enemy they want to attack, making the performance um, more efficient, or they could move the game character or control the camera perspective to increase game immersion and even facilitate the selection of objects the player looks at. In our work, we want to highlight that other gaze interactions that are inherently more challenging are possible, and we propose to explore what we can do with our eyes closed. For example, the fact that with the eyelids closed, we can still move our eyes. To test this, 
we designed an interaction technique that relies on closing our eyes and predict the position of targets behind the eyelids. So users need to roll their eyes with the lids closed and open them when they think they are looking at the target. And finally, open their eyes to look if they were right. To demonstrate this, let's make a test from home. I am going to propose that you look at our game character here on the left, and on the count of three, I need you to close your eyes and roll them so you are looking at this monster when you open them. So when I say three, you look at Wonder Eye, close your eyelids, and try to aim your gaze at the monster. Ready? One, two, three. Well done. You've discovered your secret talent to be able to roll your eyes behind the eyelids. We use this technique in Kryptonite for game control, and we transform it in the power of teleportation. The game introduces this powerful technique in three different game examples that span in the three levels of the game. First, the game introduces the interaction technique in a relaxed way, so players cannot lose because there is no challenge, but to understand how to use the power of teleportation. In the level, Players need to collect the energy boxes by teleporting to jump the walls of this maze. Once completed, level 2 presents a more challenging shooter game in which players need to attack different monsters by teleporting on top of them. However, in this level we explore the interaction technique to require players to close their eyes and roll them behind the eyelids. To achieve that, we introduce elements of penalization in the game narrative. In the game, the air is filled with kryptonite, our hero's weakness. Looking at the game scene makes Wonder Eye lose power, and only by resting with our eyes closed, the energy can be refilled. This way, the player necessitates to close their eyes in advance and attack the monsters by surprise behind the eyelids. Moreover, this level poses the challenge of performing different eye movements behind the eyelids to attack different monsters. For instance, some of them remain static, other monsters can change position to require the player to perform saccadic eye motion with the eyes closed. And finally, other monsters are in continuous movement and require to rely on our motion prediction skills with the eyes closed. The last level presents a fast-paced final big boss fight. This level challenges the player to jump obstacles and wait until the optimal moment to attack the final monster. Accordingly, this requires the player to be very familiar with the interaction technique to succeed in the game. Something characteristic about our game design is that rather than adopting the interaction metaphor what you look at is what you get, which is broadly adopted in gaze interaction design, we integrated a technique that is based on not looking as the main game mechanic. However, Closing your eyes when using a technology that relies on sensing where exactly on the screen you're looking at might be perceived as anti-intuitive or of poor usability. Accordingly, in the design process of Kryptonite, we looked for narrative references, which we call metaphors, to explain the need to keep your eyes closed. We can find several examples in our daily routines as we close our eyes to meditate rest our sight or sleep. For instance, in the game, great power comes with great responsibility. Teleportation is a tyrant superpower and looking at the scene drains your energy. Therefore, players need to make sure they perform their actions behind the eyelids and get a good rest to overcome the game challenge by closing their eyes. In conclusion, we explore a novel game mechanic that leverages what we can do with the eyes closed. This contributes to advancing the use of gaze in games research. Beyond the presented technique and game experience, our work opens up a distinct space of inquiry into interactions using looking versus not looking and eye movements with our eyes open versus closed. Moreover, the game design introduces new metaphors that contextualize the action of closing one's eye. This suggests that there are plenty of opportunities to introduce eye closing, for instance, when we need to concentrate, rest, or to control our special powers of teleportation. As such, we want to leave you with three key takeaways of our work. First, 
there is more to gaze interaction than looking at the game scene. And game designers who want to integrate gaze in their experiences should think about gaze behaviors that go beyond looking. Accordingly, with our game design, we identified a new design space for research inquiry, looking versus not looking. And we utilize a range of actions that contextualize the need to close the eyes. This points out there are opportunities for future work to explore new metaphors that leverage what we can do with the eyes, but also support the context of the interaction. This was Kryptonite, a game that you play with gaze without looking. I'm Argenis Ramirez Gomez, thank you very much. Thank you. It was a very interesting game design idea. All right, any questions? We do have a little bit of time. Oh, okay, there is one question from Teresa. The question is, does this have any therapeutic applications? Uh, it's a really, really good question. I think that um, there could be in the sense that if we start integrating this kind of um, metaphors, interactive metaphors into uh, games, we deem that that might um, have an effect on the presence that you might experience in the game. And obviously, um, as I said in the presentation, uh, closing the eyes is a practice that you uh, we do when we meditate. So in that sense, we could integrate kind of like a gam gamified meditation inside um, a game that could lead to that, um, uh, to creating this therapeutic application. And uh, Denise asks, what is the mechanism that tracks the gaze? So for this project, I use a Toby IX eye tracker. And how it works is that when the eye tracker uh, loses the signal of, of the eyes. So that means that they're closed. It, it gives you back the, the user is not present. So we utilize that to, to actually detect the, the, that the player was um, closing the eyes. And next question, Travis asks, how stressed are people when they're playing? And they said that I've been so stressed whenever I close my eyes. Um, so we actually perform a user study in which we ask participants to fill uh, uh, NASA PLX. And we found the performing their technique repeatedly was something that causes a bit of fatigue, especially because we are not used to uh, blinking that much consciously uh, <laughs> in a row. So we, we found that, but then also we found that uh, during the um, qualitative analysis of the, what participants had said, that they really appreciated uh, for the most constraining level that was the shooter game. We included this metaphor of resting that they just found it was um, really good to just like close your eyes and rest for a bit until you were ready to um, get on with the challenge. Then there's another question that says, have you, have you thought about using these as a secondary interface? For example, the player could move their character with a controller and use gaze to aim a weapon or use another mechanic. Um, yes, I actually thought about the potential of this technique to be introduced in um, what it would be like a mainstream game. So I would imagine the, um, or, or something that I like to speculate a little bit is if you imagine um, games, franchises like the Tomb Raider or Uncharted, like those are games that include um, a lot of jumping, like from cliff to cliff, as, and, and I like to joke and say, without even blinking, um, the characters can do that. So if we introduce this kind of technique, so for example, if you want to perceive that you are the Tomb Raider or, or Nathan Drake, like, like just about your when you're just about to jump, what if we could just close our eyes, take a breath, then look at where we want to go, and then the jump will be um, performed as we are controlling our characters with a controller. So um, I think there's a lot of possibilities of integrating like a version of this technique or a version of like this concept of not looking um, to increase this um, feeling of presence in the game. 
Um, Teresa adds, uh, do you know EDMR therapy for people who have suffered trauma? There could be an interesting application that I don't know it and I'm interested to hear about it. So if you want, we can have a little discussion in this call. Now that's really good questions. I have a one final one. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting. When you talk about this idea of locking and not locking, it reminds me of Scott McLeod's work on understanding comics. I don't know if you're familiar with that book. So he's essentially talking about the idea of the gutter space. So for comic book, you have frames, right? Like yeah. there's one frame of what's happening in the next frame. And then there is sort of this empty space in the middle. And then he literally illustrates in the book, sort of like we're looking at the panels and then have our eyes closed in between. And he argues that's when a lot of the storytelling are happening because we are essentially using our imagination to fill in what is happening in between the panels in comic books. So I think it can also have really interesting implications or applications of storytelling of how do you leverage people's, what they're imagining, what they're anticipating. That's really interesting. Thank you for that reference. I'll, I'll check it. Really good talk. And it's a fantastic uh, track. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, all the speakers, for the presentation. And we have a couple minutes before I think there's a keynote coming up. All right. Take care, everyone.